what I want people to understand is that although there are separate sciences, anthropology for culture, psychology for cognition, and linguistics for language, those are artificial divisions and that we cannot understand any of those three without understanding the others. My cognition is dependent on my language and culture. My language is dependent on my cognition and culture. And my culture is dependent on my language and cognition. All three have to be understood before we can understand any one of them individually. That means it's more complicated. And it means that we can't jump to conclusions as quickly. But to me, that's the, that's the primary lesson about the nexus between those three. Welcome to The Story of Language, an original podcast series about language, linguistics, cognition, and culture. My name is Christian Saunders, and I am an English teacher. And throughout this series, I will be in discussion with Dan Everett, linguist, anthropologist, philosopher, and author. In this episode, we talk about culture. We discuss exactly what it is, how it exists on a macro and micro level, and how it affects our language and our cognition. And without it, we would die. If you would like to contact us, you can find us on Twitter at Story of Language, or you can send us an email at storyoflanguage at gmail.com. This is episode three of The Story of Language. So today we're going to talk about uh, culture, and and I think... Um, that before we can talk about culture, we need to actually have a good definition of culture. Because for most people, when they when they think about culture, it's like music, uh, books, and maybe like maybe like national dress, and that's pretty much it. That I think that's you know the majority of people that's what they understand is culture. But culture is much more than that, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I often distinguish between culture with a capital C, which would be art and literature and those things, um, and culture with a small c, which is what anthropologists study. And my own definition of culture, anthropologists have found it notoriously difficult to agree upon a definition of culture. So rather than sorting through everything, um, I mean, I review in my book, Dark Matter of the Mind, I review a lot of the definitions that have been proposed and then settle on my own, which is an abstract um, network of values, ranked values, um, knowledge structures, and social roles that are shared uh, among people who live in a particular area. But actually, the area is not so important. It's just the fact that they're shared. And that means that culture uh, can be more sharing in which you could say the cultural link is stronger or less sharing in which there is a cultural link. So I would say that the people who like the same music, let's say the, all the jazz lovers of the world, it doesn't matter whether they're in Russia or Africa or the United States or England, in a sense, they share in a culture. Um, Whereas many of the other things, their knowledge structures and their val- their ranked values and their social roles could be quite different. So the more values that you share, the more rankings that are similar, the more knowledge structures that you share, the more social roles that you share and participate in, the closer you can be said to be culturally. But, but here's the thing. For me, culture it, is not actually out there in the world. Um, there's we can see its its products, but we can't, there is nothing really called culture. What there is, is um, an individual's knowledge structures, an individual's value structures and, and hierarchy, and an individual's social roles that they participate in. And, and when two or three people share those things, I mean, they uh, overlap, 
um, then we can say that they are participating in a culture. But the culture is an abstraction across the individual's brains. It's it's interesting that you would say that culture doesn't manifest itself physically because again i'm sure that for most people you know if they if they go to italy and they see an opera or or they you know they they see the italian food and to them they are kind of visual manifestations of culture they are definitely uh, visual manifestations of the output of these shared values and knowledge structures and social roles i wouldn't call them themselves culture um, you know, it's, it's like, um, if, if I make a cake, that cake is a representation of something I did, but it's not me. Um, I mean, it's one of the byproducts as I pass through the world, one of the things I did and you collect all these artifacts that I produce, whether they're books or cakes or, or, uh, alcoholic drinks, whatever, whatever they are. And then you can piece together a theory of what I must've been like but I'm the, the nexus that connects all of these things and they simply are clues to me. So all of these, you know, when we go to Italy and we enjoy the architecture and the food and the history and all this, these are simply the residue of culture. These are the things that culture has produced, but I wouldn't call them themselves culture. Hmm. And, and it's interesting what you said before that, that if you have somebody in Russia and then somebody in, in New York, you know, who, who both like jazz music, then they're sort of sharing in this jazz music culture. But then obviously they're also part of, well, you know, the New York culture or the Moscow culture. So, so you can belong to, to multiple cultures? Yes, you can belong to multiple cultures to the degree that you share in these basic atoms of culture, which are ranked values, knowledge structures, and social roles. So I don't think that culture is is a purely local thing, although it's clear that the people that we grow up with are going to be the people that we tend to share most with. So that is the more obvious uh, manifestation of culture between us. I started thinking about these uh, about this idea of culture many years ago, watching interviews on British TV when I was living in England that... Um, um, they were interviewing kids, Muslim kids and Christian kids uh, from different parts of Europe. And they, they all said, you know, I don't really care what religion somebody has. I care what music they listen to. If somebody listens to a certain kind of music, then I relate to them. Then they're, they're part of my culture. And I thought, you know, there's a sense in which that's correct. Whatever is most important to us, religion is one thing, music is another thing. So we might share the taste in music, but differ in our taste in religion. Um, and uh, in that sense, we don't, we're not the same culture. I mean, you know, we talk about um, American culture, for example, or Australian culture, but those are big abstractions because, you know, the, the values and knowledge structures and social roles of New York are not those of Alabama. Uh, there is some overlap, but, um, and, and what I would say where people get the idea of American culture is that Americans very often will overlap in these things, uh, their beliefs and, and knowledge structures and values uh, more than they will with, uh, say, New York and Nigeria. But there still can be overlap in these other ways. So all these, just like language, there's no such thing as the English language. Um, there are... Uh, many dialects and ultimately just idiolects of English. And so if you look at an idiolect, the way somebody speaks, well, you talk like who you talk with. So the more I talk to somebody, the more we will talk alike. And so you could call that our dialect. And, and then eventually that expands out to a language, but it's an abstraction. It's the way that individuals talk and how they overlap. Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's a big problem, actually, in the, in the English language teaching industry is that students only think that there's two types of English, which is British English and American English. And, you know, they don't even kind of realize that, that, as you say, you know, within America or within England, you can have enormous differences in, in, in language. Yeah, just tremendous uh, uh, variations from state to state, from county to county, uh, Indian English, uh, 
is, is a dialect of English, just as valid as American English or British English. Um, you know, some of the pronunciations of, uh, that we find in some dialects in America are older than the pronunciations that are found in many dialects of England. Uh, they each have their own history, uh, but they're abstractions. And the same thing applies to culture. Culture is also an abstraction. Mm, okay. So I'd, I'd like to start talking a little bit about kind of the, the, the relationship or the dependency between cognition and culture and, and language. And, and, and I want to start by asking a question. So are there cognitive universals? Like, are there things that we share as, as humans? Well, it depends on how broad your notion of cognition is. Um, Adolf Bastian, who was a, one of the founders of ethnography, uh, who uh, lived in Berlin uh, uh, in the 19th century, was the first one to come up with the idea, or at least stated in this way, the psychic unity of man. Um, and he wanted to argue that all people uh, have similar ideas. They have the same myths. They have the same uh, very similar ways of dealing with the world. Um, and so he believed that we share cog cognitive universals that are really content of universals. So he influenced many people. Franz Boas was his assistant at the Museum of Ethnography in Berlin before Franz Boas moved to the U.S. Uh, Joseph Campbell, the great uh, uh, personality in, in pushing the idea that there's a universal myth that everybody shares, um, the, these were advocates of the psychic unity of mankind. In a sense, Chomsky is an advocate of this because he believes that all languages are basically the same. So if one perspective on cognitive universals is that they're actually um, propositional content that is shared with among all humans, uh, whether that's a myth or whether that is a, a way of solving problems or whether that is a universal grammar. Um, another perspective, which is more is more closely related to my perspective, is that um, we have the same bodies. We have to deal with the same problems of clothing and shelter, uh, or at least protection from the elements and food. Uh, we have the same emotional centers. The human emotional centers are shared with many other creatures, including reptiles, and they so they go back millions and millions of years. Um, so we all feel fear, we feel love, we feel the, you know, we feel certain emotional needs. In that, at that very general level in which our brains are part of our body and our bodies are physiologically the, pretty much the same, then I also believe in some cognitive universals. But I don't believe that those cognitive universals uh, show themselves in the kind of propositional content of uh, the same myth, uh, you know. So the idea that everybody has a belief in God, I don't think that's true. I mean, the Pinaha don't have a belief in God. The idea that everybody has myths about their origin as a people, that's also false. The idea that everybody has numbers, that seems to be false. The idea that everybody has culture. So I don't see a lot of evidence for that kind of cognitive uh, universalism. But I do see a lot of evidence for the idea that humans, the human body exists in many places and in many associations. If there's one thing that is most common to all humans, it's our need for community and a language to establish that community. Mm, I mean, it's there has been some work done sort of looking for these cognitive slash kind of linguistic universals like the work of Wijbika and and these kind of non-semantic primes but but yeah as you say they tend to be things like needing wanting uh love and hate and and really like as you say kind of reptile brain kind of basic human existence things right yes and and i've interacted uh, you know in my writing i have responded to a lot of years because uh, work on these kind of universals and uh, i suppose it's something that she and i will always disagree about because i don't see evidence for those things um, um 
I don't see the necessity of proposing those things to understand the things that I am interested in understanding. Um, it is interesting that this idea of innate cognition is one of the most appealing ideas to come out in the uh, in the last couple of hundred years since since at least Bastian, and uh, I find it puzzling. But it's people seem to like the idea that we are similar not merely in our bodies but in our propositional content that we we all seem to think in similar ways um and i don't disagree that we think in similar ways peter ha uh, do think in similar ways to uh, americans for example but but i i would argue that it's only in the sense that our intelligence gives us a way of solving problems that our body faces across the world mm, i mean yeah because because some you know some of the things that that I think most people would imagine a universal, like for example, numbers and colors, um, and and which for a long time people did think were universal because you know for a long time linguistics was very kind of Eurocentric. You know, they were only looking at a very limited amount of languages. But but now it seems that you know now that linguists are looking at more um, isolated languages like Pidaha, they're discovering things like yeah, colors. Are not universal and and even numbers which which kind of blows my mind really <laughs> yeah because we're used to being in a world that is that has problems that we have posed that can be solved by numbers but if you don't have any problems needing num a numerical solution because you so design your culture and you live in such an environment that those problems numerical problems don't arise uh, you don't need numbers and so what what is an example of a, a situation where we use numbers, but they don't? And one of the most common questions I get about the Pitaha is, you mean they don't know how many children they have? A Pitaha mother doesn't know how many children she has? We find this absurd, but why would you need to know how many children you have? You know their names. You know what they look like. You know, if you think of the movie Home Alone, um, they left Macaulay Culkin because they didn't look in their children's faces. They counted them and mistakenly got a neighbor's child in there. If they had been Peter Ha, they would have never left him because they wouldn't have counted. They would have looked in their faces. <laughs> they would have left without him. So sometimes numbers are a bad solution. Wow, that, 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 is, a, that is a fantastic example. I mean, yeah, I mean, but they're, they're the kind of things that I think it's impossible you know, when you're so encultured, you know, it's impossible to imagine other ways of thinking, you know, like that, for example. Yeah, I mean, we think about what's natural for us, and um, and then we assume that's natural for other people, but there are 7,000, at least 7,000 different cultures and languages in the world, and we have probably gotten data on, partial data on maybe half those, you know, to be wildly optimistic, maybe 4,000 out of 7,000. So we're not much above half, if we're even there, uh, in the collecting data. So we haven't even done the job of describing all these cultures. You can't propose universals if you're lacking descriptions of half the cultures in the world. <laughs> it's true. But I mean, like numbers, for example, whenever whenever you see scientists debating about how we would communicate with aliens, they always say, well, mathematics is the the kind of the universal language of the universe because everybody knows mathematics. I suppose that may be true of space travelers. Uh, you know, so somebody coming here from another planet, it's, it's likely that they use mathematics to get here. Um, but if we were arriving at another planet that was largely jungle and populated by hunter-gatherers, it, it's a questionable assumption that they, they have mathematics. So it really depends on, on what kind of people we're expecting to meet. We often expect to find people who are as technologically advanced or more so than we are, but it's also possible that we would encounter people who are quite happy hunter-gatherers, you know? I mean, hunter-gathering is the national, is the nat natural response to a plentiful environment that changes very little. Um, you just walk out there and get some food, come back and talk to your friends and eat it. 
And as long as the environment keeps producing that for you, what's the challenge? Why would I need to develop technology or mathematics? It's not to say that I couldn't, because there certainly are hunter-gatherer groups that have, but hunter-gathering is a very healthy, it's, it's physically, it conditions the body, it provides a much more diverse diet than agriculture, um, it's a much easier way of life. People think of hunter-gathering as hard, but actually it's a much easier way of life. And as long as the environment doesn't change, the two great forces of culture are imitation and innovation. Imitation always works um, when the environment is constant. Somebody else has figured out a solution, I don't need to figure it out, I just do what they do and I'm okay. Innovation almost always fails in those kinds of circumstances. But when the environment changes, as for example, it did for all humans during the Pleistocene, um, you know, two million years ago, um, then innovation, not imitation, is needed because imitation will kill you if the environment changes radically and the old solutions no longer work. Now you need innovative solutions. And that means um, uh, cultural change. But as long as the environment's constant and healthy for everybody, there's no re reason for cultural change or lots of innovation and certainly not numbers. Well, 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 that sort of maybe partially answers something that I'm wondering about, which is, isn't something that kind of humans have shared throughout all of their history is this kind of curiosity, right? It's like why we climb mountains and why we um, have built tools and, and maybe sometimes necessity, but also humans do lots of things out of curiosity. And, and you know, my question is, why is it that, that some of these hunter-gatherers um, seem to lack that? essential sort of human trait like why is it they don't want to go and explore or, or you know invent stuff when the environment is constant and it's always it provides for you you do have curiosity but not in the idea of exploring new environments because um your environment is just fine for you and you already know almost everything there is to know about your environment so any pita hot child uh, knows about the flora and fauna in which, in the environment in which they live. They can tell you about any animal or any plant. They know all about it. They know how to get uh, their food. They know how to take care of themselves. They know. So the idea of going outside this sort of Eden uh, to find uh, other things is, it just doesn't make much sense. But if you live in a larger industrial society in which the environment is constantly changing and you're competing with people. So that's another thing about the Pitahan, many hunter-gatherers, they're not competing with each other, they're cooperating with each other. But when we get into large societies uh, uh, where we're competing with each other, innovation is always necessary and exploration and proving ourselves in some ways, these become values, whereas they're the opposite of values among the Pitaha. It's uh, doing things that upset the apple cart that could throw off the balance. The, the other thing, too, is there's, there, besides the two great forces of imitation and innovation, there are the two fundamentally distinct types of societies, societies of strangers and societies of intimates. The Pitaha, for example, and many other hunter-gatherers live in societies of intimates. Everybody knows everybody. In our larger societies, that's the way our family is. Our family is a society of intimates. We know everything about our family and maybe some of the people we went to school with if we went to a small school. But we keep our friends close to us. But the overall American society, for example, is a society of strangers. When I step outside my door, I don't recognize most of the people I see. Um, and so I'm in competition with those people that I don't know. So I need to be constantly curious, constantly trying to innovate, constantly trying to solve problems. Whereas if I step outside my door or don't even have a door, I just wake up on the ground next to my friends and I know everybody and we're all doing just fine. Um, I just want to talk to them. You know, I don't want to compete with them. We're just, uh, hey, let's go do this. And um, it's not a question of I'm going to try to get all the fish out of this region of the river because when we get back, even if I did beat you, and I got 30 fish to your one, we're gonna share it anyway. So um, it really doesn't matter. I'll share with you today and you'll share with me tomorrow. 
if you don't share with me tomorrow, then I might not share with you the next day. So there is that built in. But um, competition, um, I mean, I tried to introduce games to the Pita Haas when I first got there. I thought, you know, everybody likes to play games, and most of our games are competitive, They're like soccer and um, and racing and this sort of thing. And I remember trying to get a – I got a sack race going where people – one leg – you know, people had to put two legs – one leg from each person into a sack and I tied it and then they had to race against other people. And they all thought it was great, but when the one pair got close to the finish line, they stood and waited for everybody else to catch up. <laughs> they didn't really understand competition in, in the same way. No, they didn't understand it at all, really. I mean, I get them sometimes to engage in, in uh, archery contests. Uh, those are kind of difficult because it's hard to find any who ever misses uh, anything uh, but once once they do they um, it doesn't mean anything to them it's really insignificant <sighs> like w when I when I hear you talking about about you know the way that these hunter-gatherer societies kind of operate and their values and I do kind of wonder you know where we went wrong because there seems to be so much unhappiness in the modern world um, that we need to go back, right? Well, there's a great deal of unhappiness. Um, and I would agree that there's more unhappiness in larger industrial societies than there seem to be in hunter-gatherer societies, when unless some major change happens in that society. But uh, uh, there's the other thing is individualism. We, we are strongly motivated to, to have our individuality noticed. Um, so YouTube is very popular and uh, and Instagram and, and social media. I was just talking to my anthropology class about it the other day. Um, why are these things so popular? Why do we care about others' attention? It wouldn't matter to the Peter Hans, I don't believe. I can't imagine that one Peter Hans would give a rip how many more likes they got than somebody else, you know? it's. Um, but there's something about our self-worth. We don't get our self-worth from becoming members of a group. We want our self-worth to become, um, to come from standing out and not being part of a group, for being individuals. Uh, and I'm not judging that. I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm simply saying that it's a descriptive difference between societies. Um, and uh, you could say that, I mean, in general, I think there, you know, there are studies that show whenever the television is introduced in societies that didn't have it, um, the level of happiness goes down. And part of the reason for that is they start to see other ways of living and to want those things. You know, so I think poverty is, is a cultural concept. It's not an economic concept. Uh, the Pinaha have almost no material goods but they don't desire any, so they can take care of themselves. So I wouldn't call them poor in any, any absolute sense of the word. Whereas uh, people in the Amazon, other Amazonian groups who have televisions in their communities and have seen all the material things that outsiders have and then begin to want those things, they become dissatisfied. And now I would say they're poor. Uh, they become impoverished. They want things they can't get. And, and that's part of being poor. Uh, but once again, if you can't provide food and shelter and take care of the basic needs, then that's poverty. But I'm talking about the Pitaha and other Amazonian groups who can provide the basic needs, but can't provide all the material things that they see other people having. having. And once you start to become competitive in, in, in acquisition, um, then you become dissatisfied. Yeah, it's uh, no, I, I, I agree 100%. I mean, you know, so many things in life are relative, like, you know, there are, there are people who will cry when their relatives die, there are people who will cry when their homes are destroyed, um, you know, by by tanks, and there are people who will cry when they can't get the Nike trainers that they want, you know, I mean, so many things in life are relative and I think maintaining perspective is, is, is a really important thing in, 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 in maintaining happiness. Yeah. I mean, you know, for a, for a large 
part of my life uh, because I was, uh, my family was very poor and we lived in a trailer when I was little. We lived in a, in a very old Airstream trailer without a bathroom, my, my mother and father and I. And um, so the perverse thing is that I've always liked those trailers. Uh, <laughs> and I've always, I've always wanted one. So, so you know, we, we eventually bought a small caravan trailer, Airstream, uh, to go about and camp in remote places, which I love. But the second that somebody pulls up with a longer one, a bigger one, you think, oh, I could have had a bigger one. Uh, and But when you're out there by yourself, it doesn't occur to you that life could get any better. Uh, you know, you've got a 19-foot trailer and somebody pulls up on a 35-foot trailer and, and uh, they've got, you know, a 60-inch television screen inside their trailer, which is not really camping in any sense of the word. Um, <laughs> then suddenly you say, oh, I wonder, you know, and then you, you realize how silly you're being because... Um, the whole purpose of camping is to fuel the environment and everything. And already in a small little camping trailer, you insulate yourself from the environment. The Pita Ha camping is to sleep on the ground and take what comes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, what, what, what those people don't realize in that big 30 foot trailer is that is that you've really you really know what camping is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, when you know, people. Um, you know, even my own children, they sort of forget how they were raised. And they'll say, we're going to, it's going to be really rustic here, dad. I said, do you recall <laughs> where we have slept and, and how I have, uh, you know, spent half my life sleeping in hammocks in the jungle? You know, I mean, uh, I can, I can handle rustic. That doesn't mean I can't also handle luxurious. Uh, <laughs> if somebody puts me up in a five-star hotel, uh, I'm not going to cry about it. Uh, but but I also don't need it. You know, I can I can do just fine without it. Um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about how culture uh, can affect your your cognition, and and you've got some great kind of stories about how the Peter Hahn can basically see things that are invisible to you, and that's because of 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 their culture. Yes. Okay. So to take. To take a very believable example that doesn't stand out, uh, when I'm walking with them, uh, you know, a guy will say, don't step on that snake. And I say, what, what snake? That one right there that's not far from your foot. I said, I don't see a snake. So he'll take out his bow and arrow and shoot and then pull up this poisonous snake that was like literally 10 feet from my foot, maybe five feet from my foot. And I think, wow, I didn't see that. Um, uh, I've had other experiences that are that are even stranger where I discuss and don't sleep. There are snakes uh, one morning when everybody was standing at the riverbank looking across and crying and yelling and shouting and women were coming running with their children and men were coming. And I said, what's going on? And he said, you can't see it? I said, no, I don't see it. He said, uh, uh, there's an entity over there uh, that is not human that uh, we know of and and he is looking at us and i didn't see anything you know i still today don't know what they were seeing and i have no idea what that represents to them it was as obvious as can be um and whether you want to call it mass hysteria or uh, blindness on my part um uh, we see things that that aren't there and we don't see things that are there because of our culture so in American culture, we know that um, that whites of the middle class, if they're shown um, pictures of African Americans um, first, then and they see some action, they're much more likely to believe that was a crime committed by the African American, whereas they wouldn't come to the same conclusion if they had been shown a picture of a white person at first because of cultural biases that lead them to different perceptions of what just happened. Um, culture affects the, the way we see things, just as if in language, you know, politicians sometimes say, I say what I mean and I mean what I say, but language doesn't work that way. Nobody ever says all that they mean. That's what culture does. It extracts that meaning out of those words. Um, you know, to take one obvious example, if I said, he came here yesterday, who is he? Well, you have to know the context and you have to understand these things. 
and and sometimes so for or, or another example is you know um, someone's um, two people are going out to a party and one person's already dressed um, and they shout to the other person in the other room are you ready yet and the other person responds fix yourself a drink um, this is not a direct response and yet what we know by that because of culture is that these two unrelated sentences are culturally related and if i'm going to fix myself a drink i got enough time because this person's not just about done i mean there, there are ways from being dressed yet uh, if i were sexist i would say that it was the wife who said fix yourself a drink but i'm not sexist so i won't say that um but um uh this is um this is where language means more than we say and we say more sometimes and less sometimes than we mean usually we say less than we mean and we mean more than we say that's just the way language and culture work together yeah i mean i know that um language is is massively ambiguous um and that yeah um, as you say a majority of of what we intend to say isn't actually expressed in in our words and you know i've seen examples of teachers uh, what they do is they they ask students to to dictate a simple conversation, um, and then next to the dictation of the actual words, they have to write down what each sentence means. And the two very rarely, you know, align. Or or we could say that one thing relies very much on, you know, on on as you say, on this cultural knowledge. In court cases and in most legal settings, very often. Um, the court will go on only what was said, uh, which is is safe, but it's actually inaccurate because most of the time what we say is simply a cue to get us going. So ambiguity and vagueness are, are always present in our words, but rarely present in the context. Um, so uh, if I say, I went to the bank, that could be a financial institution. It could be the side of a river. Um, but we only know based on the context. I went to the bank and then threw in my fishing line and caught a fish. Well, that's not a financial institution, probably, unless I'm being metaphorical, which is another way in which culture affects language. You know, metaphor, simile, ambiguity, vagueness, all of these things uh, have a have an important function to play in communication. And in that larger communicative context, culture is more important than the actual words. Often language is just one small part of the overall communicative uh, process. I mean, one, one thing that I want to know about is how does this cultural knowledge get passed down from kind of one generation to another? Is that how it works? Is it is it being passed, you know, directly from from you know from father to to child, and then from from the child to their children? Yeah, that always happens. That's one of the interesting things about humans, but it varies greatly. So among the Pitaha, for example, since there are no stories of the ancient past, knowledge gets passed down by imitation and observation. Um, I explain things to you, so the you have words explaining how things work and you see the way that we live and you're gonna live the same way. So that way of life is gonna continue into the foreseeable future without any need for uh, books to explain that to you because you live your life and you observe and, and you explain things to people. So language plays a role, but it's not a historical role. We're not giving the history of, of the people. Whereas in, in larger literate industrial societies, language uh, is used to pass down information through television, through books, through uh, old stories that are, you know, family lore, uh, all kinds of ways. But the Pitaha passed down their, their culture. There's all humans, all human cultures transmit information from one generation to the next. Um, whether, but they do it in quite different ways, but they also all do it uh, at least in part by language. Yeah, because that's that's something that that I'm I'm conflicted about because there's been some work by 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 Tomasello 
and and he sort of showed that um, that dogs, for example, are able to understand social cues from humans because somehow this information has been passed down through generations of dogs because humans have lived with dogs for so long. And since dogs don't have, well, they can obviously communicate, but they don't have language. Like, I wonder, how, how is this knowledge passed down? You know, is it, it it's, it's deep in, our, in their brains? It's a, it's a physiological knowledge? Well, this is the part where most of these metaphors break down is exactly what does that mean? Does it mean that a dog is born with the concept of human and the concept of fetch? Um, or does it mean that the dog has um, been born into an environment that, that is very ancient um, and, and that they are able to recognize indexes and icons so all, all creatures can recognize indexes and icons, and dogs uh, seem to be equipped to recognize a lot of the indexes and icons that, that humans use. Uh, you know, if I start to put on uh, one pair of shoes, the dog will not get excited, my dog. And if I put on another pair of shoes, they'll get really excited because those are the shoes that I wear when I take them for a walk. Um, and so those shoes are an index of walking, of taking a walk outside with the dog. Uh, if I get a suitcase um, and I start to, my dog, my oldest, my biggest dog will uh, sulk because she knows that I'm leaving and I'm not going to be back for a few days and she doesn't like it. So she will be, disappear. I won't find her. She won't, um, you know, be nice to me. She's just sulking in the corner. Uh, because she knows I'm leaving. Well, these are these are the ability to read indexes, and also uh, the indexes reflect on the relationship that we have formed. So dogs probably do, because of their evolutionary history, form relationships more easily with people. But we see, you know, that when 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 poachers in Africa kill the oldest. Um, female elephant or uh, one of the elephants is the repository of knowledge. They know where the food is found. They know, and they have to show the other younger elephants where this stuff is. So you kill the oldest elephant, you probably killed all the others too, because they don't have the knowledge that's in the head of that one. It's not transmitted by stories, but it's transmitted as among the Pitaha and other groups and us to a large extent by example. Um, you know, so. Uh, uh, my father uh, transmitted many of his values without ever telling me they were values. I just watched him do them, and he transmitted knowledge by me simply observing. Um, and he he helped that knowledge along by using words to further the explanation. But uh, many species transmit knowledge from one generation to the next without symbols, without words, by simply seeing something as similar to something else, which is an icon, or seeing something as indicating something else, which is an index, and um, an imitation. Um, so, so humans aren't the only ones who can transmit information across cultures. And we talk about, um, uh, Charles Peirce talked about what he sometimes referred to as the guessing instinct. And by that, he did not mean an instinct in the sense of Pinker's language instinct. You know, it's not some body of knowledge that we have that we draw upon that's innate. Um, by instinct, he meant that we evolved in this world and our bodies are fairly attuned to certain kinds of things that happen in the world. And we, and we evolve ontologically within a particular culture. So phylogenetically, as a species, We've got millions of years living in the, on the earth, so our bodies fit the earth, okay? You know, people who find, for example, that we can hear speech sounds better than we can hear other sounds, this is not a profound discovery, right? Our ears and mouths evolve together, so we ought to be able to hear the sounds that we make better than other sounds. They evolve together. Um, um, so you don't need any kind of speech sounds or somehow 
genetically hardwired into my brain. It's just that my ear and my mouth evolved together. So the ear evolved to hear speech sounds. Um, so, so a lot of what we do, this, this guessing instinct, Purse was, was concerned with how do we get things right? How do we figure things out? You know, you think of all the possibilities for solving a problem that we don't consider. We seem to cons focus on a narrow range of possibilities that will lead to a faster solution. Um, and, and my reading of Purse is that there are two sources of that guessing ability, that is, our bodies in resonating with the world in which they evolved and our brains resonating with the culture in which they were formed. Um, so we don't need instinct and some sort of innate content sense. Um, and, and in fact, as you go back through time and you read philosophers like David Hume and, and Thomas Reed and, and uh, Kant, even Kant to some degree and, and Peirce, they all talk about instinct um, to, but they don't mean by it the same that modern cognitive scientists mean by instinct. It's they're very different senses of the word. And it's um, anachronistic when you read, for example, David Hume talking about instinct to believe that he means by that what Chomsky means by instinct. Um, you know, I, I can say that um, um, my ability to play the guitar is instinctual, let's say, but what does that really mean? It means that in my history as a human being, I have uh, developed an ability to do this without thinking about it overtly a lot. My question as well is, is, for example, now I'm born in, imagine I'm born in 2019 and I'm born into this world where we have, you know, for us, we have this advanced technology and we have the internet and, and you know, we have vaccines and we have a, a lot of knowledge that we've accumulated over the past, you know, well, since humans, since humans started, started evolving. And, but I, I, I wonder if, if you took me and you compared my brain to somebody born 500 years ago, you know, am I born knowing, you know, knowing maybe a little more than, than that person? Is my brain, is my brain different? Does it have more capacity to learn or? or? Yeah, I, I wouldn't think so. My, my view is that, um, I mean, these are all interesting empirical questions and nobody can say right off the top of their head that one hypothesis is right and the other is wrong. But I do think that we are born into very different environments than we were born, we would have been born in 500 years ago. And the exposure to those environments. So if you take perception, people who've never seen pictures have a hard time deciphering them. Even though for us, it's obvious. If I see a picture of myself, I recognize myself. But I am imputing, uh, I, I am uh, interpreting a two-dimensional object as a three-dimensional object. So I'm interpreting the picture. I'm three-dimensional. My picture is two-dimensional. I'm seeing the picture as an icon of myself. But that transition from two-dimensional to three-dimensional is cultural. And we know this because we've looked at societies that have no experience with two-dimensional representations and find that they have a really difficult time recognizing pictures because they simply, it's not because their brains are different. It's because they're uh, they were born into a culture that didn't have two-dimensional representations of three-dimensional objects. Our brain is capable of doing a lot of stuff. And I'm, I'm sure that in 500 years, people will be capable of doing things that we're not capable of doing today. But it doesn't mean that the brain has changed. It means the culture has changed. Actually, this is a very interesting fact. Um, in the last couple of hundred thousand years, we don't know of really strong evidence for brains evolving. I mean, they could, there's nothing that says they can't. But what we do see is cultural evolution and cultural change. And so now we are able to do with culture what at one time we could have only done with our brains. So I can share my knowledge. I can, I can live in a society where one person knows one thing and I know something else. And together we can do a third thing because we combine our knowledge. Whereas in a hunter-gatherer society, everybody is a generalist. Everybody knows how to do everything. Um, and there's very little shared 
uh, contrastive knowledge. So it's, it won't be the case that in a hunter-gatherer society, this person's a good hunter and this person's a good fisher, and we get them together and we get, they're both good fishers and they're both good hunters, um, and they're both good gatherers. Um, whereas in our societies of strangers that are much more complex, we get a lot more specialty. So our culture adds to our intelligence in the sense of accessible knowledge. I mean, I don't, I don't know anything about the archaeological evidence or about the evolutionary evidence, but, but at, at what point, you know, do, do, is, at what point is our brain different from, you know, Homo erectus or? Well, we know that when people learn things, their brains change in certain ways. It's not a phylogenetic change. It doesn't, uh, but there are a lot of people starting to think about this. I mean, it used to be thought, Lamarck's view of evolution was that if I was a great weightlifter, say Arnold Schwarzenegger, and I really developed my body, I could pass that along to my children. And, and then when Darwin came along and we got the theory of genes, we said, oh, that's what a silly idea, that, that could never happen. Uh, but now people are starting to rethink that and realize that because of epigenetics and the way that the environment can affect the activation of genes. We can all have the same genes, but if they're activated differently, and we see this in any one human body, every cell in our body has the genes to become any other cell in our body. So why don't our toes, toes grow out as noses? Um, well, the reason that we don't have 10 noses is because um, histones uh, affected by the environment um, regulate gene expression. And so um, uh, if we change the environment, let's say the typical horror film where radioactivity comes into the environment and somebody grows to be 50 feet tall, um, unlikely, but that is an effect of view of, of the environment affecting our genes. And our environment can affect our genes so that, it, I'm not saying it's implausible that culture could lead to um, different brains in different parts of the world so that some people could eventually become more advanced or more primitive or what, however we want to describe it than others. The interesting thing is we have no evidence that that is the case and we have no evidence that it ever was the case. Uh, so there's something about the plasticity of the human brain, which is a case I make in Dark Matter of the Mind, that we have evolved to have cognitive freedom not to be determined by instinctual uh, straitjackets. You know, so I, I completely reject the view of what's called evolutionary psychology. That is, that our brains formed in the Pleistocene, and uh, which in fact they did, but that Pleistocene solutions are still the natural solutions for us. I think what happened in the Pleistocene was not that our brain develop little modules for thinking through Pleistocene problems, which is basically the idea of evolutionary anthropology, which ironically means that uh, psychology didn't evolve. I mean, it's anti-evolutionary psychology. Um, I think that our brains evolved for freedom and to be plastic and to be, you know, so that I can be raised among the Pitaha or the Pitaha can be raised here and we will do equally well. Well, it's interesting because there was actually, there was the guy, August Weissman, who did the famous experiment where he, he cut the tails off five generations of mice to see if the sixth generation would eventually grow without a tail. And, and it never happened. And <laughs> I, also, um, I also read somebody said, well, uh, if you look at the Jews, um, none of them have evolved without a foreskin, even after hundreds of years of, of cutting them off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you think of all the practices that, that we, have, uh, we have had and, um, and all the things that evolution doesn't explain because it, you have to take culture into account. Uh, our biology has remained constant as far as we can tell for a couple of hundred thousand years. There are obvious exceptions that show that evolution is still possible and, and does happen. So uh, lactase persistence, lactase is the enzyme that break down the sugar lactose. And um, for most humans, it shuts off at, at the end of nursing, at the end of uh, 
at, a, at the end of infancy. Uh, so that if you try to give milk to most people uh, after the age of 12, let's say, they're gonna, it's going to make them sick. They'll get diarrhea and they might throw up. Uh, but, but there are many people uh, from Scandinavia, from Northern Europe, uh, and from Africa um, where they, they have lactase persistence. This enzyme continues uh, long after we have stopped nursing and enables us to digest cow's milk uh, into adulthood. Um, and we know that this is about 6,000 years old. It occurred in Europe and Africa uh, roughly around the same time when they domesticated cattle and started living, you know, producing a lot of milk. So we evolved to fit our culture. Our culture actually affected our genes. We see the same thing, uh, similar stuff in Tibet, for example, in Bolivia, where people who move to very high altitudes develop um, abilities through um, uh, different uh, amounts of hemoglobin in the blood and, and other uh, parts of oxygen processing. So they can actually process oxygen more effectively at higher altitudes than those of us who were raised closer to sea level. Uh, so cultural changes affect the body and affect our evolution. Uh, we know this, but um, we don't know of any culture in which um, there's a language you couldn't learn. Um, because, um, and I, I wouldn't, it wouldn't surprise me at some point if language was on the genes, but if language is not on the genes, then there's no way that you could ever produce a people who couldn't learn a specific language because we're using the general power of human intelligence to learn languages um, and not uh, language as programmed on the genes. If language were programmed on the genes, so for example, in, in Indo-European languages, there's a phenomenon called prodrop, which allows you to omit the subject. You can't do it in English, you can't do it in French, but you can do it in Spanish, and Portuguese, so you can say in English, it rains. You cannot say rains. And in um, Portuguese, you say chove, uh, uh, but not ele chove. That doesn't make any sense. You don't use the subject there. So, so that's been going on for about 6,000 years, that difference. If language were on the genes, there's no reason why you couldn't have a gene uh, that said, I'm only going to learn languages with with no subjects, uh, I'm, or I'm only gonna learn languages that have to have the subject. And if that were the case, then it would be impossible for somebody in English who, who was you know, born an English speaker to learn Portuguese. But we never see examples like that, and we don't expect to see examples like that. And that follows if language is actually not on the genes, but a part of culture. Yeah, well, that, that, that sort of brings me onto, the, onto my next sort of subject which is what a little bit what you said before that that you know culture might be might be viewed as a kind of straitjacket and you know like for example we, there's no evidence of children not being able to learn the language of the country they're born but there's plenty of evidence of adults having great amounts of difficulty learning a language as an adult and you know so it seems that maybe once you sort of cross over into adulthood, um, you know, you lose the ability to pronounce sounds in other languages. You lose the ability to hear sounds in other languages. You can't see snakes in the jungle. Culture becomes a straitjacket. Yes, culture, um, you know, when we're born, um, there are a lot of connections between synapses that we don't need. So what we find throughout the our development is children is synaptic pruning. We're cutting back on the connections between neurons because it's either use it or lose it. And we don't, and so um, we get into certain habits. We, we hear certain sounds that we're habitually hearing um, more easily than sounds we hadn't heard. One of the most effective ways of saying this is a, a Brazilian woman that I knew uh, many years ago, uh, had lived in England for a while and never really mastered English that well. And she said, my tongue is habituated to Portuguese phonemes. And, uh, yeah, well, that's pretty much right. You know, you have to, uh, you have to have, uh, motives to break those habits. Um, you know, I mean, it, and it applies whether it's phonemes or whether it's the food we like to eat. You know, I tell people, um, 
if you say that you like other cultures and you don't like their food, you're only f deceiving yourself. Um, you have to, food and language are the two things that show me you've really learned that culture. And even if you're fluent in the language, if you don't like their food, well, I don't think you've really learned that culture. Not you've, You haven't become part of that. You have to like the food and you have to be able to speak the language to prove to me that you really have understood the culture. And even that doesn't prove it. It's just these are the two best forms of evidence that, that we have. But, you know, why is it that some foods are disgusting to us. I mean, that, that's a whole nother area is disgust. Why do we get disgusted by some things and not others? And we see it in, in for example, sexual behavior. Why was it at one time that homosexuality was considered disgusting? And today it's not, uh, at least by more enlightened uh, people, in particular the younger generations who, who sort of escaped a lot of the prejudice of, the, of their uh, parents and grandparents. Um, disgust is a function of culture. You know, we, we're disgusted. I mean, partly it's the body. I mean, the body uh, produces noxious byproducts of eating and drinking, um, and we tend to have a natural repugnance to those byproducts, although not everybody has the same level of repugnance, um, you know. Um, so, that that's all culturally uh determined i mean yeah like in 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 china they have that thing called a century egg which is like a which is like an egg that they leave to basically rot and it's like a delicacy and i couldn't think of anything more disgusting yeah there's a lot of food like that you know i mean one example that that i've given before is that i was in the in the pita ha um making myself a sandwich i had just arrived and so when i arrived sometimes i have sandwich and salad stuff that lasts for a couple of days and then I'm off that. Um, but I had this sandwich and I was squirting some uh, mustard out of a plastic bottle onto it. And when you squirt it out and the bottle's almost empty, it makes a, an unusual sound. Um, and so this woman came up behind me and she said, look, Dan's eating bird shit. <laughs> and uh, I, you know, because the mustard looked just like bird poop and, and it sounded like it. And, and I turned around to say that I wasn't, but she was sucking the brains out of a rat. <laughs> so she had a rat head in her hand and she was sucking the brains out. And this is a great example of what's disgusting is culture. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Um, yeah, I like mustard. I've never eaten rat's brains. I don't, yeah, uh, like you say, it's, it's what you're used to. I mean, um, but, but, you know, should, should, should adults kind of feel dismayed that, that they, they no longer have this elastic ability that we had as children? You know, is there any way, is there any way that, we can, um, that we can learn about new cultures and, and, and adapt to them? This is why diversity is so important in every part of our lives, to be surrounded by people who don't look like us, who don't talk like us, who don't necessarily think like us, this expands us. Um, we are enriched through diversity. Um, I wrote an article a couple of years ago called Seek Out Strangers. And, and um, if we're not, if we don't know people who don't look like us and who don't think like us, you know, just as language is you talk like who you talk with, thinking is you think like who you think with and you, um, tend to hang with who you look like. I mean, that's a slightly different thing, but we tend to feel more comfortable uh, in non-diverse environments. We like our environment to be homogeneous, but actually that's not healthy for us. The best environment is the diverse environment. So I tell business people, I said, if you're sitting at a conference table and everyone sitting around the table uh, looks like you, that's the wrong place. You've got the wrong composition to your group. There, there have to be people who don't look like you, and some people say, well, what difference does it make how they look? It's how they think. But the fact is, if they look like you, they're not going to think that much differently than you because they've experienced the same kinds of things as they grew up. You know, white males of my age who grew up in this country um, simply don't think about the world in the same way as white females my age. And they certainly don't think about the world 
as uh, African American teenagers think about the world. So if I want to solve problems and I want the greatest number of solutions, distinct solutions, then I'm going to want to be with people who aren't like me because that's how we solve problems. Diversity is, is, is crucial for the survival of our species. And I think that's why we have my own personal theory of why we don't have two sexes, why we have, uh, we have male, we have female, we have intergender, we have trans, and then we, then we have different, uh, you know, people who are born with ambiguous genitals. Um, and then we have gender, which is a cultural matter, uh, you know, so we have, why is it that there are, why do people get attracted to people of the same sex, you know, what the, because biology loves to produce diversity. These can all be good for us. So the more diverse perspectives we find on sex and on food and on uh, professions and on uh, what's pretty and what's ugly, uh, the more we learn and, and the, the greater our environment is for us. Um, so I certainly don't want to be on a desert island with somebody who looks like me. I certainly don't want to be on a desert island with another middle-aged or old white guy. Um, you know, I, that, that, is, that doesn't sound appealing at all, but also we're, not, we're less likely to come up with solutions to how to get off the island. Um, we'll both probably sit there and, and wonder why nobody's coming for us. I, I actually wanted to, to talk about the opposite of that. If, you know, if, if so much of, of being human is 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 you know is your culture and and who you who you who you interact with and the language you speak and everything what 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 are humans if you take away culture you know what what is the blank slate like what's left of of us when there's when there's no culture uh there's a very um needy body left behind um roughly if you take away culture we die we can't survive without it. Um, we certainly can't develop any kind of interesting life without culture. Um, what makes us different from all other creatures is our ability and our need for culture and, and the need for each other. There, there is no species in the world that needs each other more than we do. We are so needy. Um, we have to have other human beings to live, no matter how independent you think you are. Uh, I mean, the ironic thing is about all the individualism on YouTube and Instagram is saying, please recognize me. We're appealing to a group. Instagram obviously would have no appeal if nobody else could see it. I'm not going to be posting pictures of myself for myself to see. I'm picture posting pictures of myself for other people to see because that is an expression of how desperately I need other people. Um, so even individuality is, is an advertisement for sociality. You need to have others for the individual to make any sense. Um, and, and so with culture, we, we are who we are. And without culture, um, basically we would be a, a functionless, dysfunctional um, uh, creature that is not likely to survive very long. Hmm. Fascinating. Um, so just before we, just before we go, what, what, what is it that you want people to really understand about, about the kind of the, the connections between culture and cognition and, and language? What I want people to understand is that although there are separate sciences, anthropology for culture, psychology for cognition, and linguistics for language, those are artificial divisions and that we cannot understand any of those three without understanding the others. My cognition is dependent on my language and culture. My language is dependent on my cognition and culture. And my culture is dependent on my language and cognition. All three have to be understood before we can understand any one of them individually that means it's more complicated and it means that we can't jump to conclusions as quickly but to me that's the that's the primary lesson about the nexus between those three <laughs>